Okay, uh, why don't we get started? It seems like I went a little bit long the last time, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, why don't you do that? Okay, so we were talking about vaporization, and I mentioned surrogates. <clears throat> so uh, this is an area of, of great interest um, when you're dealing with practical fuels and trying to model practical fuels. For example, um, we have a project currently with the Navy uh, who are interested in a particular diesel fuel that's a standard throughout the Navy called uh, F-76. It's a NATO fuel. And uh, they would like to be able to determine whether changes to that fuel, let's say because of uh, fuel infrastructure issues during uh, combat periods and so on, whether the changes are going to have a significant effect on legacy Navy engines. So what we're trying to do to help them is to develop models that would allow you to assess the impact of changes to the fuel composition um, in a, a pretty quantitative way. So here's an example. Uh, we have models where we represent fuels with a variety of components. We actually have a palette of about 40 different uh, molecules that we can use uh, that represent these various classes of chemical classes that are known to be important in the fuels, the alkanes, aromatics, cycloalkanes, and the PAH uh, species. Um, and so in this particular case, we can represent diesel fuel by, uh, I think, 18 components in, in this model, uh, drawn from these various classes of species in such a way as to be able to match the distillation curve uh, quite faithfully uh, here for diesel, jet A, and JP8 as well. And at the same time as matching the distillation curve, match various other parameters that are of interest uh, and also important, such as the density, viscosity, surface tension, the lower heating value, the percent of the saturated alkanes, aromatics, the olefins, the naphthenes, and the CH ratio, and even the molecular weight of the fuel. Um, so we've developed some optimization codes that allow you to draw from our long list of potential surrogates uh, and come up with a composition that allows you to match all of those characteristics. So this would be our multi-component fuel in this case, <clears throat> and we would then track the uh, fuel using the models I described previously. Here's another example. Uh, the, the fuels for advanced combustion engines, the face fuels, there are nine of those fuels. Uh, there's published data uh, with chemical analysis that shows the percentage of paraffins, the percentage of uh, alkene, alkyl benzenes, PAHs, naphthenes, benzenes, and so on in the fuels. And here, for instance, we use a 20 species surrogate database uh, with the species that are indicated over here um, to match the characteristics of each of these nine phase fuels. Uh, and again, the concern is to uh, make sure we can match the distillation curves, CH ratios, and all those other physical parameters. So here's the nine, phase nine fuel, uh, which consists of these species after our optimization tetradecane, decalin, uh, various species that are drawn from our, our uh, palette of potential species. And after going through the acti activity coefficient exercise with the UNIFAC model, you see that most of these species, being nonpolar, have activity coefficients close to unity. But there are some, like for example, phenanthrene, this PAH here, that essentially, uh, that has a fairly large activity coefficient. And this one in particular influences the heavy end of the distillation curve uh, because of the, uh, the you know, non-ideal vaporization uh, associated with that particular species. 
<clears throat> so here's the phase one fuel. I'm just giving some examples. Uh, the distillation curve. Um, we match the distillation curve by actually calculating the vaporization of a droplet that is undergoing flash boiling uh, and look at the evaporated fraction uh, as, uh, during, as a function of temperature during the heat up of the droplet. Um, and in this case here you see the, the uh, surrogates that we used to match the, uh, the physical properties. Okay, so I've discussed atomization, I've discussed uh, breakup, um, coalescence, vaporization, and I just want to discuss briefly spray modeling, kind of put together all those models. And one of the first things that we noticed that was of great concern was that the spray models were significantly dependent on grid resolution. So here you see a very coarse grid simulation on four millimeter mesh, uh, all the way down to a quarter millimeter mesh. And I'm showing you the spray at a particular time. There's the droplets, so uh, this is at one fixed time after the, the beginning of injection. And on the fine mesh, you see the spray is penetrated all the way across the domain, whereas on the coarse mesh, we have much lower penetration. And the reason, after looking at this for some time, it was tracked down to the fact that the droplet drag is totally overpredicted when you have a coarse mesh. So just to give you a ridiculous analogy, if I inject one droplet into this room, the momentum that is transferred from the drop to the gas in this room has to be spread over the entire room here, right? So basically, I I'm, I'm essentially lose that momentum interaction, and the, uh, the fidelity of that. Whereas if I have a very fine mesh, I have the problem that there's no droplets in the cell, so I don't have enough collisions. So there's basically two effects here, that you don't want to keep a mesh that's too coarse or a mesh that's too fine. So to deal with this, <coughs> we uh, analyzed where this error is basically being introduced, and it's right here at the injector. Basically, injecting those high-velocity drops into this giant computational cell, and the momentum exchange being calculated uh, is just not faithfully uh, simulated. Same problem we had with those droplets impinging on a wall, right? Where we had this large computational cell, and the droplets were seeing much lower gas velocities than are actually present in the boundary layer near the wall because the cell size was so large. To get around that, we used an analytical solution to correct the CFD simulation subgrid scale. So we do the same thing <coughs> for sprays. Right at the exit of the nozzle, we know we have these coarse uh, cells that are, are not able to resolve the subgrid scale process of atomization, breakup, and momentum transfer. So instead of using the CFD calculated velocities in those cells, we use a velocity that's obtained from a gas jet uh, model, an, an, an analytical model where the gas jet is injected, would be injected with the same momentum, mass and momentum fluxes as for the liquid jet uh, in our uh, actual simulation. So then we, instead of using the CFD predicted velocities, use the gas jet velocity, and we actually have the profile of the gas jet from analysis that we can use to drive the spray. So when we do that, we find we're able to correct this problem. And the correction is really only applied in a few cells near the injector where you just don't have enough cells, enough droplets to resolve the correct uh, momentum transport between the drops and the gas. So now you see we're able to predict pretty much the same penetration over a wide range of uh, cell sizes. These pictures are all shown at the same time after the beginning of injection. And you can see much improved uh, models. Just by correcting what happens right here at the nozzle exit, where we were under-resolved. We were just not able to predict the momentum transfer between the drops and the gas. So the gas jet model is now standard in the codes we used. You notice that if you have cell sizes on the order of a millimeter or so, uh, you can still get reasonable predictions without the gas jet model, but when you start talking about coarse meshes, you really need a correction. Yeah. 
So the question was, is that a problem in commercial codes? Yes. However, a lot of commercial codes are now recommending that you refine the mesh locally near the injector. And that's a valid approach, except for the second part here. And that is that if you don't have enough droplets in your computational cell, you're going to misrepresent uh, the physics of the droplet collision and coalescence. So there is a compromise. Uh, and also, there's another fact, and that is right at the beginning of today, I mentioned the void fraction being close to that of a gas, namely 0.9. When you start going down to mesh sizes of the order of microns, that void fraction limitation becomes violated, and the equations need to be changed. And none of the commercial codes that I know of do that. So I would not be in a real rush to just say, oh, I'm going to solve my problem by using a fine mesh. You have to go back and re-examine the whole problem. Anyway, that's just a side point. So we have uh, developed these models. We want to validate them against experimental data for sprays from gasoline injectors, for diesel injectors. Here I'm just showing some results for injection of uh, a gasoline surrogate, namely iso-octane, uh, into a chamber. This is a multi-hole injector, six-hole injector. Here is the spray tip penetration as, as a function of time. Uh, we were able to match the experimental data over certain ranges here. Here's the local drop sizes. Um, again, there's some mesh size uh, influence because of the factors that I've been discussing here. But overall, between you know, plus minus five microns, we're able to match experimental and um, measured uh, drop sizes within the sprays, as well as uh, droplet velocities measured in these sprays. A lot of work is going on at the Sandia National Labs, in particular the uh, engine combustion network is publishing uh, reference data that's widely used now by researchers to as validation data for sprays in a constant volume vessel. Uh, there they measure the spray penetration as well as other parameters, soot formation and so on in very uh, standardized sprays under standardized conditions. Uh, here are some examples where we've modeled some of the uh, Sandia spray data showing spray tip penetration versus time. Um, for the liquid penetration, these are vaporizing sprays, and the vapor penetration for various meshes. Uh, it's going from three millimeters down to one millimeter with different uh, time steps, numerical time steps. And you can see reasonable agreement um, over a fairly wide range of conditions of vapor and liquid penetration. There's still some effects, especially for time steps, and those are generally not uh, discussed much in the literature. Um, however, uh, the things that matter from the point of view of your simulation are, here's your spray being injected. What is the extent that the liquid penetrates before it's all vaporized? And what happens to the vapor? How does that, it penetrate? Um, it turns out that for steady injection, one reaches a certain liquid penetration length. That's a function of temperature. And what I'm showing you here is comparisons between experiments and computations for various chamber densities. And you can see we're able to predict the trends of liquid uh, penetration length as a function of temperature for a fairly wide range of uh, temperatures. This is in the absence of combustion. All right? Uh, one of the engine combustion network uh, standard sprays is the so-called spray A. Um, we, uh, I'm going to show you some modeling of that standard spray. The conditions that are being changed here are the temperature of the gas in the constant volume vessel, the amount of oxygen in the vessel, or in other words, the amount of exhaust gas recirculated if this was simulating an engine, the density uh, of the gas in the chamber, and the injection pressure. Uh, the models that we use are shown here. The breakup is the KH instability models, the multi-component vaporization model. We use a model called the generalized RNG K-epsilon model. I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, I think, tomorrow. 
combustion, we use the speed chem chemistry that I mentioned to you that allows really fast simulations with detailed chemistry. For droplet collision, we use a, a radius of influence model. I didn't talk about this here, but basically as you reduce the size of your mesh, uh, I mentioned that at a certain moment you're going to have too few droplets in a cell. One way of dealing with that is to say, well, for the droplet collision uh, process, I'm going to use, instead of the, com the computational mesh, I'm going to use a separate mesh that makes sure that the mesh size stays adequately large, that I get a sufficient number of collisions to be st statistically meaningful. And we call this the radius of influence model. Again, this is described in some of the, of the uh, references. We use the gas jet model near the nozzle for uh, correcting the, uh, the subgrid scale interaction between the jet and the gas near the nozzle. And then the soot formation is that multi-step model. Uh, we're looking at basically the liftoff length, the, in other words, where the flame is located uh, downstream of the injector, as well as the ignition delay. And here's just an example of a computational mesh with nice fine mesh near the uh, axis and close to the nozzle, because this is a reference case. In other words, out of engine, we want to see what the models are capable of doing. Non-reacting, here's our spray just uh, to show you the things we're interested in. We're interested in the liquid penetration length, that's shown down here, and the vapor penetration length as a function of time, that's shown here. And you can see a very good agreement between the experiments and the simulation for both of those quantities. For this case here, for instance, we're running pure nitrogen, so there's no combustion. Um, at conditions shown uh, over here. This is a single hole nozzle with a diameter of uh, 0 0.084, that's 84 microns or 90 microns. Injection pressure 150 megapascal, taken from the Sandia website. Okay, so the other thing we're interested in is the soot model. So if we have the spray modeled nicely, can we use our soot models to understand uh, the sooting process that accompanies these sprays. I discussed this yesterday. Uh, we have our pyrene species generated from our detailed chemistry that leads to soot particles. We have surface growth, coagulation, condensation, and so on. Uh, so we discussed this yesterday. <clears throat> uh, so to supplement the soot model, we also need a chemistry model for the fuel, which in this case was dodecane. So we developed a reduced chemistry mechanism for dodecane, combined it with the PAH uh, model for the soot precursors and came up with about 104 species, uh, 400 reaction mechanism. Uh, a lot of the details of the, of, the, of the dodecane mechanism are shown here and also in uh, Hu Wang's paper. Uh, I discussed all of this last time. We spent quite a bit of time validating the dodecane mechanism. Uh, it turns out that the ECN um, uh, working group had recommended a mechanism for dodecane that was many more species than this that uh, we found didn't match existing data in the literature for shock tube data for ignition of dodecane. And we think our mechanism actually matches data a little better. Um, you can see in, this, in these plots here some comparison with experiments for uh, jet stirred reactors and flow reactors, not only for the main species, but also for the PAH species. Uh, here's some more. This is um, the solid lines are the uh, 255 species mechanism that the ECN group was recommending. Uh, the dashed lines are, the, are our PAH uh, dodecane mechanism shock tube uh, data, and then we also have, as I mentioned, other uh, comparisons from jet stirred reactors and so on. Um, if you're interested, again, Hu Wang's paper can provide that data. Okay, the other very important thing is, okay, if you're gonna do a combustion calculation, you better make sure that you've resolved the jet correctly. I've shown you that we are able to predict the tip penetration and the liquid penetration fairly well. 
Fortunately, at Sandia, they also made measurements of the mixture fraction across the jet at various axial distances from the injector. So looking along the center line, we then look radially outwards and we see these profiles, the solid line uh, from the experiments at 10, 20, 30, sorry, 10, what is that, I can't read, 30, 40, 50 millimeters downstream of the injector. The dotted lines are kind of a bound of the experimental uncertainty. The red lines are our simulations. And you can see we kind of match um, the, the profiles. One of the things that we found that's really influential here is the turbulence model. And I'll talk more about the turbulence, I guess, uh, later. Uh, but uh, you can see the axial mixture fraction that's along the center line is matched quite well uh, against the experimental profiles. So this is for non-reacting mixture, just to make sure that we're modeling the jet correctly. So the next slides then compare the combustion situation. Uh, here are the pictures from the Sandia database as a function of gas temperature. And we're looking at the soot uh, concentrations in parts per million in a gray scale here. Uh, also, these pictures show the liftoff length. That basically, there's no combustion prior to a certain distance downstream of the injector. We're injecting downwards in these pictures. At a certain point, the flame anchors. And that's the so-called liftoff length. And this liftoff length decreases with increasing uh, gas temperature. As shown in this plot here, this is liftoff length versus gas temperature. As you increase the gas temperature, the liftoff length decreases. Um, here I'm showing two curves. The red one is our predictions. The, uh, with open symbols is the prediction using the uh, 255 species model um, that I mentioned earlier. So we're able to match that fairly well. Uh, but more importantly, we're also able to match uh, the location of the soot clouds as a function of temperature. So here you see, corresponding to this case, the soot uh, field, and we're showing uh, the scales are pretty similar here in ppm. Uh, and as you see, as you increase the gas temperature, you see more soot being produced. The location of the peak soot is again roughly coinciding with what you see in experiments. Uh, here you see, as a function of time, the total amount of soot in the domain. Uh, and as you can see, it increases uh, during the injection and the establishment of the flame uh, and reaches much higher levels with higher temperatures. So qualitatively or even quantitatively, these uh, look fairly good. Um, here are those same simulation results that I just showed you, showing the soot uh, in parts per million for the various temperature cases. Uh, just to show the precursor species, this is the pyrene species that is used to essentially provide the initiation for the soot model. Um, and the peak pyrene is located really where the peak uh, soot is located, as we discussed yesterday when we were talking about the soot model. And then just for interest, we're showing the soot particle size uh, distribution. Peaks are, if you look at the axis here, around 16 nanometers the peak uh, soot particle size. And there's some data in the literature uh, that shows, that agrees with that. You see here a measurement of soot particle size. It's in the range between five and 20 nanometers. So we, we think we're in the right range, uh, even for the soot particle size in this modeling. Uh, having a model that's kind of validated, we think we then use it to explore things like the effect of uh, ambient oxygen concentration uh, and ambient temperature. In other words, what happens when you increase the amount of EGR, you go from blue to black. And you can see that for any given temperature, going from blue to black increases the amount of soot significantly. And that's a well-known trend that we're able to predict. Uh, here we're looking at the effect of the chamber density, not as uh, as pronounced as the EGR effect, but nevertheless, it's there. Of course, in each of these plots, you see the soot increasing uh, with temperature. Uh, here we look at the effect of uh, injection pressure, 
Low injection pressures for a given gas temperature give you much more soot, as you might expect. Higher injection pressures means you entrain more air into the spray, which then serves to oxidize the soot and reduce the total soot. Uh, here's also the liftoff length uh, shown as a function of, in this case, the uh, oxygen concentration. Um, so at low ambient temperatures, you see significant, significant effect of the EGR or the uh, oxygen concentration on the liftoff length um, because of the dilution, right? <coughs> Lowering the uh, flame temperature. Uh, also, what else do I have here? Uh, looking at the effect on liftoff length of density and um, uh, what's the last one? Injection pressure. So those are all trends that the model uh, is able to predict, and they agree with um, data that we have seen in the literature. Someone asked earlier about model constants. So this shows one of the things you can do with these models. You can go in there and, and look at change of model constant, see what happens. And many times you find nothing happens. On the other hand, sometimes you find this model constant is crucial. So for example, in the soot model, we find that this, the acetylene surface growth model constant and the soot particle coagulation model constants are the most important constants, but mostly the surface growth constant. So here you see what happens if I have my baseline data, the blue here, and I increase the surface growth constant by a factor of 50%, I predict more soot. So this tells you really, if you want to improve the soot model, this is where you should be working, right? You don't need to work so hard on the particle co coagulation model because it doesn't seem to have as much of an effect as the surface growth. And I think this is one of the powers of these models, right? Is to kind of indicate where the important processes are so that you can devote your energies to improving that part instead of working on something that has less effect. We've also done uh, work on uh, engines, and again, I'm going to skip over this uh, part here, looking at soot, <coughs> first of all, sprays in uh, an actual engine. This is the Sandia optical engine uh, of uh, John Deck and uh, Mark Musculus. Uh, with a transparent piston, you look up in the engine combustion chamber, and you can look at the spray plumes look at the liquid penetration lengths, compare those with your models. Again here, we're looking at mesh sensitivity and time step sensitivity. Make sure that the results are reasonable. So, to finish up then our discussion today, uh, what I've tried to do is to describe some validated spray models that basically allow you to capture most of what we consider to be the important physics in vaporizing sprays under engine conditions. Uh, we, using these models, can represent realistic fuels and even non-ideal vaporization effects, such as uh, effects due to uh, polar molecules in the liquid phase. Uh, these improved models allow you to um, consistently predict the distribution of fuel in the combustion chamber. And of course, this is a prerequisite for the combustion modeling and also for engine optimization, which will be the topic of tomorrow's lectures. Uh, one of the important things that we have tried to accomplish is uh, predictions that are independent of numerical um, mesh effects, mesh and time step effects. And this is very important because you could mislead yourself into thinking something was uh, due to physical effects when in reality it's not reproduced on a different mesh. Why is that important? Well, because when you're trying to model a complex engine geometry, sometimes you just cannot keep a uniform mesh size everywhere in the computational domain. So your spray is going to pass through areas where you have finer meshes and other parts where you have coarser meshes. And the result is that you better have a spray model that's insensitive to the mesh size. Uh, a lot of very valuable work is being done by the group at Sandia through the uh, engine combustion network. Uh, and basically, every day, more data is appearing on their website that is very useful for uh, modeling sprays. 
And we're using that data not just for the ECN sprays, but also we have interactions uh, looking at oxygenated uh, species uh, and various other uh, fuel compositions and so on. So it's a very important activity. Um, I think they, there are annual meetings uh, that sometimes uh, coincide with ILS or ICLAS meetings where 200 people show up, uh, everybody working in spray. So this is a very uh, nice um, feature that's obviously going to lead us to more and more accurate spray models in the future. That's all I had to say for the discussion today. Questions? We have some time for questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm just oh. curious. Right. <clears throat> Are people trending in that direction? Or yeah. They just make sure it works for one case and then use the model to evaluate it and optimize. So the question is, uh, what is the sensitivity of the predictions to model constants, and how do you basically validate a model in one range and then extrapolate it to another range? Uh, yes, that's as I said earlier, that's a significant part of our effort, uh, and in fact, we've. Um, one of the, we've done some interesting work, for example, one paper, we said, okay, let's, we've got an engine, let's see what the models predict about sensitivity to parameters, like let's change the diameter of the injector nozzle. What's going to happen to soot? So we do the simulation for a range of injector nozzle sizes, and we get a result, and then we go to our friends in the labs downstairs, and we say, is this consistent with what you guys see when you run with different nozzle sizes? And uh, hopefully we could even make a quantitative comparison, but generally that's not always possible. As long as we see a consistent trend, we feel like the model is useful. Uh, and I think, you know, being uh, quantitatively predictive to the third decimal place is not, you're not in the right room for that. We're talking about trends here. Because actually the trends are the, are the first step in that process. Uh, once you can match trends, you can then start talking about you know, higher fidelity uh, modeling. I agree with you, though. It's, uh, you know, it's very dangerous to validate your chemistry model at 700K and then use it at 1200K, or even worse, validate it at 1200K and then try to use it at 700K. You better make sure that your validation data covers the range of interest as much as possible. And that goes for injection velocities, injection pressures, gas densities, gas temperatures, all of those things, and even fuel types. So yeah, it, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to validate these models. The good thing, though, is that the sub-models that I've described to you today are based, most of them, on experiments that were done in a much simpler environment. Like, for example, the law of the wall, all right, heat transfer model. You can flow heated gas down a pipe. There's not a lot of argument about what the flow conditions look like. You can make these measurements and you can establish a wall heat transfer model. Not a lot of discussion. If you use that model now, which has been validated over a wide range of Reynolds numbers and so on, in your engine simulation, you feel a little confident that I'm using a good model. You can mislead yourself though, because hey, if you have flow recirculation and separation that's not represented in the pipe, but is going on in the engine, well, you better make sure that uh, your model still is valid. And that's where an engineer comes in, and why we can't just give these codes to anybody to run. An engineer has to look at the results and say, well, you know, I'm seeing something here that's probably not validated. So it's not at the point and click stage yet, unfortunately. 
Any other questions? Yeah. So we also work with uh, Paul Miles and Mark Musculus at Sandia who are running optical engines. Uh, Paul does a light duty engine and uh, Mark heavy duty engine. And both of those uh, are really valuable because that's where you see the real flows or something that looks like potentially the real flows in a real engine. In particular in Paul's engine, he even has a glass piston with the valve cutouts that you would see in the metal piston. So the flow field probably looks very similar to an actual engine. The one thing that's different though is the material, uh, the, the conductivity of quartz being way less than that of a metal piston. So heat transfer is going to be different, but from a fluid mechanics point of view, it's probably a lot of interesting uh, similarity between an, an actual engine and his engine. So yes, uh, I don't know of basic experiments that you know you can say, oh, I'm going to spray into a, a flow with a different turbulence length scale that's uniform everywhere and see what happens. Those would be very difficult to design. And uh, you know, you'd spend a lot of time designing a piece of apparatus that uh, probably would only give you data at a few points. Uh, you know, and then we'd get back to the earlier question of how many data points and what's the range of validity of your model. So, at some point, I think optical engines are uh, actually very, very useful. But, you know, they, uh, there you are uh, changing a lot of things at the same time. So. Mm. More questions? Okay, so uh, we will meet tomorrow morning. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>